uh, definition. So what we're talking about is the active intentional ending of a patient's life. And the concept of intention is clearly crucial. This is the doctor's purpose to end the patient's life. Uh, so we're not talking about palliative care where a doctor administers palliative drugs in order to ease pain and where the shortening of life may be foreseeable. Um, we're talking about the intention of ending life by a physician, not by relative. The current debate is should we legalize lethal injections by a physician? Because death is thought to benefit the patient. That's at the heart of euthanasia. This is a good death for the patient, typically because the patient's suffering and wants to end their life. So we're not talking about selfish killings by doctors or other people. So I'm going to refer to euthanasia just generally as lethal injections. That's what I'll be talking about, intentional active steps to end a patient's life. Um, the debates about active euthanasia in, around the world, should we uh, legalize uh, lethal injections? But it's also worth mentioning that it's possible intentionally to kill a patient by deliberate omission. You can intentionally hasten a patient's death by withholding or withdrawal treatment or tube feeding. Now, in the vast majority of cases where treatment or tube feeding is withheld, uh, this is not the doctor's intention, so they're not cases of euthanasia cessation of what's regarded as futile treatment or uh, the treatments become excessively burdensome and that's why it's being withheld or withdrawn. And I think it's important to note that it is conceptually and practically possible uh, for passive euthanasia to take place, right? so we shouldn't forget it. But the focus of my remarks today is a lethal injection. Um, we can subdivide euthanasia into voluntary, non-voluntary and involuntary. Voluntary euthanasia, VA voluntary active euthanasia, is where a lethal injection is requested by a competent patient. Non-voluntary active euthanasia is euthanasia of an incompetent patient, like a baby or a patient with advanced dementia. And involuntary euthanasia is euthanasia which is not requested by a competent patient. And the doctor nevertheless gives them a lethal injection. Most of my remarks will be about voluntary and non-voluntary euthanasia. Physician-assisted suicide is the intentional assistance by a physician in a patient's suicide because it's thought death will benefit the patient. Now, the, uh, the, the phrase that's come to dominate the debate today is assisted dying, but I never use this phrase, except to explain why I never use it, uh, for two reasons. It's tendentious, it's deliberately designed to promote physician-assisted suicide by making it sound a very natural process. Um, we're not talking about helping patients to die, that's what palliative care doctors do and other doctors. We're talking about intentionally helping patients to kill themselves, and I think we should be very clear about our terms and our terminology. Uh, assisted dying uh, uh, conflates the natural process of dying, which is ethically and legally uncontroversial, with intentionally helping the patients kill themselves or intentionally killing the patient. And it's also vague because some people use it to mean all three things, palliative care, euthanasia, and physician-assisted suicide. Uh, so for that reason, I don't use it, even though it is now, unfortunately, a very common phrase. I'll refer to physician-assisted suicide simply as lethal prescriptions. Okay. What's the law? Well, briefly, uh, Anglo-American law, uh, lethal injections are regarded as murder. Physician-assisted suicide is the crime of assisting suicide. The law allows medical conduct which foreseeably shortens death, so palliative care which foreseeably may shorten death, or withholding or withdrawing futile or burdensome treatment, foreseeing the patient will die sooner uh, is, is lawful. Uh, 10 US jurisdictions now allow physician-assisted suicide, and Canada allows both uh, VAE and PAS. And in fact, it allows nurse practitioners as well to uh, assist patients in suicide. What's the position in Europe? Well, uh, VA and PS are generally legal, but the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg permit both lethal injections and lethal prescriptions. And because of a quirk in Swiss law, it allows anyone to assist anybody else to end their life, provided the motive of the person giving the assistance is not selfish. Okay, why, is, uh, why are lethal injections and lethal prescriptions illegal in most countries around the world and in most states in the United States? I think there are two reasons. The first is the ethical and legal principle of the invaluability or sanctity of human life. The Walton Committee captured the prohibition on intentional killing in the following terms. It's the cornerstone of law and of social relationships that protects each one of us impartially, embodying the belief that all are equal. 
So the prohibition on anyone intentionally killing anybody else, including doctors intentionally killing their patients or helping them to kill themselves, is based on the notion that we all share a fundamental equality. And the minute the law goes down the road of saying, well, now doctors can kill some patients or help some patients to kill themselves, the law is basically saying the lives of those patients don't have the same value as the lives of others who are protected by the prohibition on intentional killing or assistance in killing. Um, and there's a second, an allied consideration, is concerned about probable abuse if the law were changed, especially to the more uh, marginalized and uh, vulnerable members of society. Okay, there is of course a raging debate about whether the law should be changed. Should the law be changed to permit either lethal injections or lethal prescriptions in certain hard cases. And what I mean by hard cases, let's take the case of someone who's terminally ill, hasn't got long to live, is suffering, the suffering may be difficult to get under control, and they competently ask the doctor for a lethal injection or a lethal prescription. Well, there are arguments in favor of changing the law to allow uh, VAE or PAS in such hard cases. The one you'll probably hear most about is respect for autonomy, the argument that the patient has a right to make their own decisions about such important matters, and we should respect that right. The second, beneficence, isn't, the, isn't it the duty of a doctor, a healthcare professional, to alleviate suffering? Well, if so, doesn't that extend to killing the patient or helping the patient kill themselves? Shouldn't we be compassionate? Isn't uh, PAS and VA required by compassion? A third argument is that there's no difference between foreseeing and intending death, that the palliative care doctor who administers morphine foreseeing the hastening of death is really carrying out euthanasia because there's no difference between foreseeing what you're doing and actually trying to bring it about. So the law, it is argued, is being hypocritical and medical ethics is being hypocritical because you treat them both the same. And finally, opinion polls suggest a clear majority of ordinary folks want the law relaxed at least in these kinds of hard cases. Those are the kind, those are the four main arguments put forward by Professor Emily Jackson in this good little book called Debating Euthanasia. Um, those are her key arguments, and she's a leading advocate of legalization. Um, now, in this book, I respond to the 10 most popular arguments in favor of legalization, including those four. And I'd just like to suggest a number of responses uh, to that case that one often hears. In relation to autonomy, it's true that autonomy is important. We like to make important choices in our lives, but it's not all important. Um, there are all sorts of choices that we're not allowed to make, and it's wrong to make. And the law rightly restricts our uh, choice in certain cases. To think of a simple example, the law in many states will require that you wear a crash helmet if you uh, ride a motorbike, or if you wear a seatbelt if you drive a car. Uh, even though you don't want to. You may say, I really don't want to wear a seatbelt. It's my autonomous choice not to wear a seatbelt. The law says, too bad. You want to drive? You've got to wear one. Why? Because the value of your life is so important, and we're not going to allow you recklessly to endanger it by your stupid decision to drive without a seatbelt. So there are all sorts of restrictions that we reasonably place on autonomous uh, choices, especially choices that uh, are, involve a risk of harm to a, to a basic good like life or health. And secondly, a related point is just how autonomous would many of these requests for lethal injections or lethal prescriptions be? We're talking about someone, by definition, who's in a very bad state. They're terminally ill. They may be suffering gravely from their physical condition. They may be suffering from the side effects of powerful drugs used to treat their discomfort. Um, they may also come under the influence of relatives uh, who may uh, encourage them, in inverted commas, to request um, an euthanasia or assisted suicide. And we know that many patients who do feel suicidal are suffering from depression. Many uh, sources um, caution us that, that uh, depression is strongly associated with the desire to end one's life, whether as a result of a breakup of a relationship or as a result of a terminal illness. Beneficence and compassion, yes, of course we should be beneficent, but the response is, uh, again, the value of the patient's life means that uh, you're not benefiting them by killing them, you're actually harming them, because their life is a value, their life is a good, uh, and therefore killing someone isn't a benefit to them. 
the compassionate thing is to kill the, pa the patient's pain, not to kill the patient. True beneficence, true suffering with compassion is being with the patient, holding their hand, doing the best that palliative care can achieve. And palliative care now is able to do far more than it ever has in human history. So it's interesting that uh, amongst medical professionals, palliative care specialists are especially opposed to the legalization of PAS or VAE. Uh, is it true that there's no difference between foreseen and intended death? Well, I had root canal for the first time last week. <coughs> I foresaw it wasn't going to be a walk in the park. Right? Uh, actually, the dentist was, was very, very good, and I didn't feel much discomfort, but I felt some discomfort, inevitably. The fact I foresaw the discomfort didn't mean I intended the discomfort. So traditional medical ethics under criminal law has long drawn a distinction between what we intend and what we foresee. It's always wrong to intend something bad. It's not always wrong to foresee something bad. And the fact we foresee something doesn't mean we intend it. Right? Um, and finally, public opinion. Well, yes, the opinion polls do tend to show strong support for legalization, but with respect, uh, how many people responding to those polls are uh, sufficiently informed about the kinds of issues involved? These are complex, moral, legal, medical matters, and the ordinary person in the street isn't necessarily well placed to form a balanced view. So one House of Lords committee did its own research into opinion polls and said, first of all, many of these polls are worthless because they just ask uh, very um, primed questions to elicit a particular desired response. And secondly, uh, often the response is little more than a knee-jerk reaction that the ordinary person has. Um, so that select committee was very dismissive of the polls that have been carried out. And even if the polls were true, uh, public opinion tells us nothing about whether it is right to legalize an activity. Maybe that the vast majority of people support capital punishment. That by itself is not part of capital punishment. Many points throughout human history, the majority of people have supported all sorts of immoral practices. So there's an overview of the debate. I recommend this little book. It's a short paperback. You can read it uh, in a couple of hours even. Uh, a very good introduction to the uh, ethical uh, debate. Well, what if uh, you thought, well, you know, I think maybe uh, lethal injections or physician-assisted uh, physician suicide are ethical in certain hard cases. It still doesn't follow you should support legalization. In fact, many people who sympathize with them in hard cases from a moral point of view, nevertheless say we still shouldn't legalize them because it would be really dangerous for society in all sorts of ways. And there's a famous debate, six years old, between Professor Glamour Williams, uh, a very eminent law professor at Cambridge, uh, specializing in criminal law, and uh, Professor Yale Kamizar, uh, Williams died some time ago, Kamizar is still alive now, he's 90, a very eminent American expert on constitutional law and civil liberties. And they had a wonderful debate 60 years ago. Williams said, yes, we can safely legalize euthanasia and position assisted suicide. And Kamizar, in his first article as a very young law scholar, uh, writing, well, you know, even though I sympathize with euthanasia in certain hard cases, I wouldn't want to argue against it, nevertheless, I'm against legalization on purely utilitarian grounds because of the dangers it would involve to individuals and society. Why? Well, Kamisar put forward basically two slippery slope arguments. Um, what I'm going to refer to as the empirical argument and the logical argument. And the question we're addressing is, would there be a slide from the hard case where you might sympathize ethically with euthanasia or opposition assisted suicide, all the way down to less deserving cases, for example, <coughs> ending the lives of old people because they're lonely, they're suffering from loneliness. So many people think, well, I sympathize with the hard case. Of course, it would be terrible if we started killing old people because they were expensive to look after, or demented people because they're expensive to look after. We don't want that. So if there's a real risk of sliding down that slope, let's not set foot on it at all. all right? Now, there are two slopes uh, to the mountain here, and so there are also two slippery slope arguments against any legalization. And here they are, the empirical argument and the logical argument. They're quite independent arguments. People often run them together, or often just think of this one, but it's important to realize there are two. The first argument says, well, you know, how do you go about drafting and enforcing a law that would allow 
either PAS or VAE. So for example, if you wanted to say, well, we'll allow it for patients who are suffering unbearably. Well, how would you define unbearable suffering? I mean, I could challenge anyone in the room to draft legislation which would precisely capture the hard case. You'd end up almost uh, using something like unbearable suffering or terminal illness or terminal disease. What's a terminal illness? Not easy to define. There's no consensus about what they mean, those concepts. So it's difficult to draft the kind of legislation you would need to capture the hard case. And even if you could draft it, how could you then police it? How could you ensure that doctors only ended life or helped patients to end life in those cases and no others? Would you have a police officer at every doctor's elbow in their office to ensure that only the hard cases were being uh, accommodated? So that's largely a practical argument, but a very real one that Camus are pointing to. Um, but this, I think, is actually even more powerful, the logical argument. And it runs like this. That if you think there's an ethical case for physician-assisted suicide for the terminally ill, kind of Oregon-style law that we'll be looking at, you, and presumably you believe that because, well, we should respect the patient's autonomous choice. If the patient wants to die, wants a lethal drug, that's an argument for giving it to them. And beneficence, they're terminally ill, so we'd be helping them by helping to end their life. Well, if you buy that, then you equally buy voluntary euthanasia for the chronically ill. You're equally committed to that. Now, you may think, no, 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 that doesn't follow. There's no, there's no logical connection between lethal prescriptions for the terminally ill and injections for the chronically ill. But there is, and you can see it right there, right in front of your face. Because if autonomy and beneficence justify lethal prescriptions for the terminally ill, they equally justify lethal injections for the chronically ill. Of course they do. If a patient says, well, doctor, I, I, you know, I'd rather you didn't prescribe drugs for me. I might vomit them up or, uh, you know, maybe I'm paralyzed. Maybe I can't even, you know, lift the cup to my lips and swallow them. I need a lethal injection. I want a lethal injection. Well, then respect for autonomy should lead you to support lethal injections, not just lethal prescriptions. And equally, if the patient's chronically ill, uh, you know, the patient's autonomy, uh, the autonomy of the chronically ill should still be respected, and beneficence should be respected as well. This patient may say, hey doc, I'm not just gonna live for a few months, I've got 30 years with this chronic condition. That's 30 years of suffering. So I'm more deserving of your intervention than the turn of meal. So that's why, if you accept physician-assisted suicide for the terminally ill, then logically you accept voluntary euthanasia for the chronically ill. And the next step also, I think, is unanswerable. You must accept lethal injections for people who are not competent. Now, why is that? You might think, surely that's a different case altogether. Well, it's not really, because if euthanasia can benefit those who ask for it, voluntary euthanasia, it can equally benefit those who can't. The absence of autonomy, say, you know, a demented patient, does not cancel the doctor's duty of beneficence. If the doctor's got a duty to eliminate the suffering of a person who's competent, then the same duty applies to the incompetent who's suffering to the same degree. So again, that's a logical link between voluntary and non-voluntary euthanasia. So if you buy into this, you buy into a hell of a lot more than may first appear. <coughs> So those are two very powerful arguments. How am I doing for time? For, all right, not too bad, yeah. Time for a joke, or not? <laughs> Save it to the end, okay. Uh, so far, so in a way, that's the most important slide of the presentation, right? That's the most important slide of the presentation. There's some more important ones as well. There you go. Uh, so some people say, well, that's hogwash. You know, all these slippery slope arguments, it's just uh, speculation. Gamble Williams says, all speculation, um, nobody's legalized you know, either yet, so let's do it and see what happens. And Camisar said, well, no, it's too dangerous. You know, you've got to be really careful about taking slips down slippery slopes because they can have profound consequences. Um, and uh, in his brilliant article, and I'd encourage you to read Camisar's article, um, and I did a, a chapter, an essay a few years ago, revisiting their debate. So you can see it all my list of publications, you can see the citation. Their debate is as relevant today as it was 60 years ago, really. And, um, and uh, Kamizar said, well, you know, you've got to be very careful. I would hope that, you know, 
the US Supreme Court or legislators wouldn't ever seriously breach uh, the rights of people, but they have done in the past. You know, They have done in the past. You have the Dred Scott case about slavery. You have Korematsu about uh, corralling Japanese Americans into camps during the Second World War. So Kamisar says, you must be very alive to even the slightest risk to people's basic human rights. Um, well, now we have some jurisdictions around the world that have taken the step of legalizing either lethal injection and or lethal prescriptions. Does either model, the Netherlands model, the Dutch, they were the pioneers of euthanasia and physician assisted suicide. They legalized it in 1984, they legalized both. The Belgians followed them in 2002, and the Luxembourgers in 2009. Uh, that's one model which allows both lethal injections and lethal prescription. And then we've got the Oregon model, uh, which just allows physician assisted suicide for the terminally ill. So what can we learn from the experience and the laws in those jurisdictions? Any, any evidence that they refute the slippery slope argument, in which case we can go on and safely legalize them, or do they cause any Concern. Well, let's look briefly first at the Dutch model. They both declared law in 1984, and legislation came into force in 2002. You often read journalists saying the Dutch legalized euthanasia in 2002. Uh, well, what do journalists know? They didn't. It's 1984. I wish they'd stop saying that. And I wish they'd stop saying they Dutch legalized it with very strict safeguards. I mean, it's now becoming something of a joke. Um, the reality is this. The Dutch law uh, of 2002 is very similar to the guidelines laid down by the courts since 1984. And there are these three essential uh, elements of the law. Uh, it requires a voluntary, well-considered request from the patient who is suffering unbearably with no reasonable alternative. And the doctor must consult an independent doctor, exercise due medical care in the way the doctor ends the patient's life, so don't botch it and then report the case to a review committee. That, in a nutshell, is what the Dutch law provides. So you can see voluntary active euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide as well. Well, again, if you read uh, many journalists, they will look at the Netherlands and tell you everything's worked well, they've got strict, strict safeguards, no slippery slopes, they're a model to be followed. Camisar's concerns, you know, are unreasonable. Well. The defenders claim they have strict safeguards and that they have ensured effective control, but Dutch data, the Dutch government themselves uh, generate, uh, generates this data through five yearly surveys of doctors. Doctors have said, yeah, we've killed thousands of patients without request. Even though the guideline requires a voluntary request, a free and voluntary request, we have given lethal injections to thousands of patients uh, the vast majority of them incompetent patients, but not all, a significant number of competent patients to whom we've given lethal injections in clear breach of the law. Um, the Dutch courts in 1996 went further and declared non-voluntary euthanasia lawful in the case of disabled infants. Why? Well, the Dutch court said, illustrating the logical slippery slope argument, if the doctor's got a duty to alleviate the suffering of a patient who can ask for it, They've equally got a duty to alleviate the suffering of a patient who can't ask for it. Just follows. Um, the notion of unbearable suffering has proved very elastic. It's not just limited to the physical suffering of the terminally ill. It can be mental suffering, psychiatric suffering, and also can include existential suffering. So if an old person says, well, you know, I've got some physical ailment, but really a major reason I want to die is just I'm lonely then the law permits the doctor to euthanize the patients on that ground. In fact, the Dutch government in 2016 said, you know what, we want to extend the law to allow assisted suicide just for existential suffering. So particularly old people who say, I'm old and lonely and tired and I just want to die, I'm not terminally ill, I'm not psychiatrically ill, I just feel desperately lonely and irrelevant and unimportant. The Dutch government said, fine, that's suffering as well, isn't it? That can be unbearable suffering. So we should extend the law to allow those people to consult two death counselors, and the death counselors can ask a doctor to prescribe the lethal drugs. Now, the government hasn't extended the law yet, but I think it's only a matter of time. <clears throat> thousands of cases have not been reported. Doctors have falsified death certificates in thousands of cases to say it was death by natural causes, even though it was actually a case of euthanasia. And the Dutch have been criticized by the UN Human Rights Committee on a couple of occasions. And several leading scholars, including Professor Theo Bohr and Dr. Neil Gorsuch, now Justice Gorsuch, uh, 
have written critically of the Dutch experience. Professor Bohr, uh, well, they're both interesting. Uh, Dr. Gorsuch, as I'll show you later, has written a superb book on this subject. Um, Professor Bohr used to be a member of one of the Dutch euthanasia review committees, and he reviewed about 4,000 cases, thinking that the law could be effectively controlled. Uh, and then he changed his mind. He said, you know, I just saw the gradual extension of Dutch law. It's been extended to a whole range of cases that I never thought it would be extended to. And I quote him uh, in my book, which I'll tell you about later. Uh, he gives a few cases. He says, for example, there was, a, there was an autistic man in his 60s and said, oh, I've lost my job. Um, so I'm suffering unbearably. And his doctor said, OK, I think you qualify. I think that's unbearable suffering. And that case came before Dr. Moore's review committee. And he thought, are you serious? This, this surely isn't coming in the guidelines uh, for unbearable suffering. It's not surely what was intended originally in 1984 or 2002. Mm -hmm. But it was approved uh, by the review committee. Another case he cites was a 50-year-old lady who was a grandmother. She was losing her sight. And uh, she went to her doctor and said, I'm losing my sight. I won't be able to see my grandkids. And that will cause me unbearable suffering. So I want euthanasia. And the doctor complied. And that case came before Bohr's review committee. And again, he scratched his head and thought, is this what we've come to? So now he is very critical. He said, watch out. Some slopes truly are slippery. Um, what a brief word about the uh, Oregon model. I think, Dr. Marine, you may be saying a little more about this. Uh, the Death and Dignity Act only allows physician-assisted suicide for those with a terminal disease. Uh, the patient makes two oral requests, a written witness request, and a 15-day waiting period. And you get two doctor's approvals, and then the attending physician reports the case to the Oregon Health Authority. So you can see it's rather different from the Dutch. Um, it doesn't require any suffering at all on the part of the patient, interestingly. Um, so more limited, only physician-assisted suicide, not lethal injections, and only for those with a terminal disease. So its defenders would say, well, look, it's working well. There's been a low uptake, um, maybe 250 lethal prescriptions uh, written every year, about 160 people take it every year. Not huge numbers. And no evidence of abuse, it's argued. There's no slide. The law has basically remained the same, no major changes. And it's uh, endorsed by the Canadian Supreme Court in Carter in 2015. The Canadian Supreme Court held there was a right to voluntary euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. And as part of its reasoning, it looked at the experience in Oregon and in the Netherlands. And the trial judge in that case has said, you know what, looking at all the evidence, I think it shows that, um, that uh, the law can be relaxed, um, that you know, reasonable safeguards can be uh, provided and monitored, and the risks of legalization can be minimized. So supports of Oregon say, well, it was looked at by the Supreme Court in Carter and given a clean bill of health, more or less. Well, a number of problems with that case. Uh, Professor Capron, probably America's leading expert on health law, in his analysis of the Oregon law, he calls the safeguards largely illusory, and I uh, document in my book why I agree with him. Um, just to give you one illustration. So uh, even if the doctor says, yes, OK, I think you're competent, and I think you're terminally ill, and I'm going to write you a lethal prescription. The patient then goes off and obtains the lethal drugs and may take them months later when they're no longer competent, when they may be severely depressed. There's no safeguard to prevent that happening in the Oregon legislation. That's just one example of a weakness. Dr. Gorsuch, in his book, says, we don't really know what's happening in Oregon. So it's all very well to say we've no evidence of abuse. Well, we've not really much evidence of anything. Because there have been no comprehensive surveys of the kind the Dutch have carried out of their medical professionals every five years. The Oregon Health Authority said, we don't know who's not reporting. We've no idea who's not reporting, how many are not reporting. And we don't even know whether the reports we receive are accurate. It's not our job to police the legislation. We are not a regulatory body. We are a steward of the data that's submitted to us, it says. Patients are not required to be evaluated by those with expertise in either psychiatry or palliative care. And some patients have had undiagnosed depression, even though they've gone on 
to end their own lives. Professor Hendon and Foley have written an important piece. Uh, Professor Hendon is a psychiatrist, Professor Foley, uh, palliative care expert and neurologist. And their conclusion is laws like Oregon to protect doctors rather than patients. Um, you could go on to say that also absence of evidence of abuse is not evidence of absence of abuse. We don't know what's happening. It doesn't prove anything one way or the other. And although there's no, been made no major extension as yet, this may simply be clever tactics. So Governor Booth Gardner, who was an advocate of physician-assisted suicide, he was pushing for a similar law in his own state of Washington. And he said, I, I wish it could go further, but these laws are a first step. Gradually, the nation's resistance will subside, the culture will shift, and laws with more latitude will be passed. So it's basically a foot in the door. Right? Once you've got an Oregon law on the books, then later it becomes very easy to argue for its extension because of that logical slope I, uh, argument I put forward uh, earlier. Why discriminate against those who are not terminally ill? Why discriminate against those who are too paralyzed and can't commit suicide on their own? How could such an extension sensibly be resisted by a legislator who accepts the Oregon model or by a court based with the claim that it unfairly discriminates against those not terminally ill or unable to kill themselves without assistance. And finally, the Carter judgment was uh, deeply flawed, uh, particularly uh, in many respects, but also in relation to its assessment of the evidence from abroad. And one can contrast it with the uh, Fleming decision in Ireland that looked at the same evidence and basically said, we can't see how the trial judge in Carter came to the conclusion she did about it being feasible to erect uh, effective safeguards. They particularly noted the high incidence of non-voluntary euthanasia in uh, the Netherlands and Belgium. Okay, so uh, graphically, here's the empirical slope. Can you uh, precisely craft the particular criteria that patients need to satisfy? Can you police that? Some people, like Professor Williams, would say, yes, you can, but others, like Professor Kamzar and myself, say, you can't. It's just not feasible. What about the logical slope? Uh, are you logically committed if you endorse physician assisted suicide for the terminally ill? Are you committed to further legalization in principle, voluntary euthanasia for the chronically ill and for those who are incompetent? Well, some say no, you can just limit it to the Oregon model. Others like myself think that's not true, that you are logically committed, whether you realize it or not, to extend the benefits of euthanasia, if benefit be, to those other classes of patients. So uh, a few conclusions. The debate is one of the most important moral and political debates of the age raises profound questions about the value of life, especially the most vulnerable, the role of the law, the ability of the law effectively to control either practice, and the role of the healthcare professions. Those two slippery slope arguments are powerful, and neither the Dutch model nor the Oregon model has refuted them. And the Oregon model is a significant step towards the Dutch model. Um, so it's, it's uh, very likely that sooner or later we're going to see a move to extend uh, uh, law in those American states that have the Oregon model towards the Dutch model. Uh, some resources, the little book uh, debating euthanasia, uh, a collection of essays uh, for and against euthanasia I edited, uh, multidisciplinary essays, uh, medics, uh, theologians, uh, philosophers. Uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch's book, The Future of Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, he writes with uh, an enviable clarity. Um, and my latest book, the second edition of my book, Euthanasia, Ethics and Public Policy, uh, Arguments Against Legalization, which I have here. So thank you very much. I hope I've kept the time. Dr. Lee. Good. Thank you. thank you very much, Dr. Kiam. Um, again, my name is Joe Marie. I'm in the of cardiology in the, uh, in the School of Medicine, and I'm not an expert on medical ethics, but I have been involved in this uh, debate in the state of Maryland for the past five years, so I was asked to say a few words uh, about the Maryland uh, End of Life Option Act and uh, all of this from a physician's perspective. This is the current status of assisted suicide laws in the USA. Um, as Dr. Keown mentioned, it was started in Oregon in 1997, so for 23 years. Uh, another state implemented in Washington about 10 years later, and since then, a total of nine states in the District of Columbia legalized assisted suicide, uh, encompassing about 20% of the U.S. population. 
In addition, it's been proposed in about 20 other states, including Maryland. This is the bill that's been proposed year after year in Maryland since 2015. For the first three years, in 2015, 16, and 17, it was withdrawn for lack of support. But in 2019, it did come up for a vote and it passed the House of Delegates and failed in the Senate by just a single vote. It's now been reintroduced in the legislature and the first uh, Senate uh, uh, committee meeting is gonna happen next week. This uh, bill creates a legal process to allow any licensed Maryland physician to prescribe a lethal drug overdose to a Maryland resident under the bus. The patient is deemed terminally ill, mentally competent, two requests spaced by 15 days, the second physician confirms eligibility, and the drugs are self-administered by the patient. So from a physician perspective, what some of us have raised uh, against this legislation uh, is listed here, and we feel that it's unethical, that it's not medical care, that it's dangerous, unnecessary, and can have broader societal effects. Physician-assisted suicide has been considered broadly unethical by the medical profession for over 2,000 years, going back to the oath of properties, which states that neither will I administer a deadly drug to anyone asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. In the modern times, the American Medical Association uh, stated that in 1993, that physician-assisted suicide is fundamentally incompatible with the physician's role as healer, would be difficult or impossible to control, and would pose serious societal risks. The American College of Physicians, the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, the World Medical Association, and many others also oppose assisted suicide as a core principle of medical ethics, a red line which protects the integrity of the medical profession and protects the public. This is the AMA uh, decision again, which was reaffirmed just this past year uh, after a vigorous two-year debate, a three-year debate and discussion and re-examination of the policy, the House of Delegates overwhelmingly voted to reaffirm it by a 70% margin. The American College of Physicians, as opposed to physician-assisted suicide for 20 years, reaffirmed their position in 2017, as has the World Medical Association, in which this comes up every year. WMA firmly opposed to euthanasia and PAS. And one of the reasons for this is that if you think about it, assisted suicide really isn't medical care. It has no basis in medical science or medical tradition. There are no guidelines or standards of care for this practice, no training in medical school or residency. In fact, I think it's very concerning the idea that it could be taught in medical schools or become a subject for research. If you think about it, giving patients other non-medical means to end their own lives would never be considered medical care, so we really shouldn't consider misusing dangerous controlled drugs as poisons to be medical care as well. Further illustrating this is after the District of Columbia legalized assisted suicide in 2017, a year later, out of 11,000 physicians licensed in the District of Columbia, only two signed up to participate. And this really shows that doctors do not support this in their actions. Dr. Kian illustrated some of the dangers of assisted suicide laws. There's no requirement for a formal mental health evaluation, minimal informed consent, no witnesses are required to the consumption of drugs, so we don't really know what happens at that time. There's no routine audits or impartial third party oversight. Physicians are granted broad immunity, uh, meaning that there's no accountability even for gross negligence. Records are excluded from discovery and destroyed every year, and death certificates are falsified to state that the patients died of natural causes. Physician-assisted suicide is unnecessary because patients may already decline any and all medical care that they don't want. They can encode these decisions in advance directives, and we know as physicians that palliative care, hospice care, and pain management programs have made great strides in the past decades. And Maryland, in fact, is considered to have some of the best programs in the country. And this is really what we as physicians should be proposing as the alternative and what the legislature should be promoting. And finally, assisted suicide, I think, is gonna affect everyone. We hear at Hopkins that medicine is a public trust. We know that doctors are held collectively accountable for the integrity of the healthcare system, for the action of other physicians. We know that doctors, nurses, and allied professionals work together in teams. And we have to have a common ethical framework be able to trust one another with each other's patients. And I'm concerned and others are concerned that assisted suicide could corrode how all healthcare professionals view patients with advanced illnesses and disabilities and question whether this could make the medical profession and healthcare system less caring and less compassionate. So the question we proposed is should we legalize physician assisted suicide? Uh, after studying this for five years, I have my answer. Dr. Kian has been studying this for decades. He has his answer. I think we all have to think about this. We all have to learn about this and come to our own answer. And so with that, uh, we're very happy to open this up to your questions and discussion. Thank you.
the trouble last night. <laughs> uh, yes, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, I was wondering, um, for the cases that you mentioned in your Netherlands, where there, I guess, you said there were documents that were found in the patients who had been denied without yeah. requesting it, were there legal, legal ramifications for those cases? Not really, no. What happened was the, uh, the the Dutch government now has commissioned six large-scale surveys of doctors, um, and the doctors are told, look, uh, you can be frank about your practice, end of life practice, because it's all anonymous, and there'll be no legal ramifications. You'll get immunity from anything you've done. So the doctors, we can assume, are pretty forthcoming. The very first survey was done in 1990, so six years after the law was relaxed, and they found 2,300 cases of voluntary euthanasia, 400 of physician-assisted suicide, and then a thousand cases where a doctor said we gave a lethal injection without any request. And uh, the uh, Dutch government uh, said, wow, uh, that's a shock. We never realized there were so many cases of non-voluntary euthanasia. Um, but the government commission, instead of saying, look, we must do everything to stop this, um, we must be ready to prosecute doctors more readily, said, you know what, well maybe it wasn't such a bad thing anyway because the committee said these doctors were motivated by the very same uh, uh, intention which was to alleviate suffering as the doctors who gave a lethal injection on request. So you can already see at that very early stage the recognition that the case for physician assisted suicide euthanasia is not about autonomy. That's how campaigners for legalization want to put it because especially in the United States autonomy is regarded as you know a prized value but really it's not about autonomy because even the proposals they put forward say well it's only certain people whose requests are eligible so in Oregon it's those who are terminally ill not the autonomy of those who aren't terminally ill it's basically a judgment that this group of patients have lives that are no longer worth living that this group of patients would be better off dead. So it's really beneficence that's doing the work of justifying ending life. And once you realize that, it makes perfect sense why these Dutch doctors have been given lethal injections to incompetent patients, because it's fundamentally about beneficence. If you think this patient with this condition is better off dead and they ask for it, then you'll think the same about this other patient with the same condition, even if they can't ask for it. It's completely logical. So that's why the Dutch courts in 96 extended it to disabled babies, and there have been moves to extend it to adults who are incompetent. Um, so basically, no uh, comeback. Uh, in fact, the, the general realization about the force of the logical slope. I would just add from the Maryland perspective in terms of autonomy, I mean, it really, if it was about autonomy, it really shouldn't require any physicians at all. Uh, but in Maryland, you have to have two physicians involved, two witnesses, and a pharmacist to dispense the medication. So it really is a bill that protects physicians rather than give a patient new rights. Good question. Yeah, I had a question regarding the statistic that you showed um, in D.C., 11,000 doctors, none of them had used it. Um, and, you know, for you to... Um, Given that it is legal, um, and given that a lot of these um, influential societies, AMA, um, have come out with a stance, um, do doctors feel a lot of pressure um, to not practice this way? And what are sort of the repercussions that they might be um, facing if, if they do decide uh, to treat this drug? Well, to take your second question, I don't think there would be any repercussions. Um, I think it's just that physicians my interpretation is that physicians just know that it's wrong, that they're, it's contrary to the way that we've all been taught um, in our values. So there, there, there really are no repercussions in the states where it's legal in particular. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the law specifies that no medical society can sanction a physician uh, that acts uh, under the law for any reason. Um, so the law you know, broadly protects physicians. I think this is just when, you, when it's time to walk the walk, physicians really don't believe that this is something that they should be doing. And if I could just add a footnote to that, which is, I think if I were a medical student, I would be very concerned, not, a, not about those doctors who, as it were, comply with the law, because the law is so liberal and so permissive, they have nothing to worry about, either from the law or from presumably their medical association. I'd be worried about my future if I didn't want to do it. Um, 
because uh, if you look to your northern neighbour, um, doctors in Ontario have been told you must refer patients. So if you don't want to do it, then you don't have to do it, but you've got to refer patients to someone who will. And the medical college there has required them to refer, what's called an effective referral. They resisted that in court, and the court sided with the medical college and said, no, you've got to be involved. You've got to the extent of referring. Lots of doctors say, I don't want to refer any of my patients to someone who's going to help me kill themselves. Well, you've got to. And there are many bioethicists now arguing, if you're not prepared, maybe not only just to refer, but not to do it, get out of medicine, because this is now a legal, if you like, procedure, and you shouldn't be imposing your morality on your patients. So I foresee that trend continuing, that it will be increasingly difficult for doctors and healthcare professionals who don't want to be involved in this to steer clear. I think the pressures will increase that you should involve and there may be legal or professional repercussions if you don't. Just to add on the question of why physicians may not participate, another interpretation I make is that physicians will be concerned about trust. Uh, I know as a physician that uh, it's, it's amazing the way patients trust us. And without the trust of patients, we really can do very little as physicians. And I, I think that physicians sense uh, perhaps that if they practice this, that patients may not trust them with their lives. Or with their lives. And if I can interject just a brief comment on that. As Professor Capron puts it in one of his articles, he said, I don't want to have to wonder whether when the doctor enters my room, the doctor's wearing the white coat of the healer or the black hood of the executioner. Interesting way to put it. Well, in the uh, latest report from Oregon, about three or four percent of people have cited financial concerns as one of their reasons for seeking physician assisted suicide. Um, so I, I, I clearly for some patients it is, it is a, a concern. I wouldn't say there's evidence yet that it's a common or widespread concern, but it would be strange uh, uh, to imagine that it doesn't play any part in the thinking of at least some patients. There are a couple of cases um, of uh, patients who have cancer uh, who requested, their doctors requested palliative or uh, experimental chemotherapy where the insurance company denied the uh, request for investigational therapy but did say that they would pay uh, for the drugs for assisted suicide. So in that sense, it's being steered um, towards it by economic concerns. And I think economic concerns are a real concern given the cost pressures in the United States Except that this is medical care, it's surely going to be the most inexpensive and cost-effective uh, form of medical care if it's legalized and widely adopted. 